Well, uh, hope you are um, doing well with this quarantine. Um, hope you are keeping up your spirits and um, uh, continuing the intellectual work of this course. I have to announce that I um, have an exam for you on the 14th of May. Um, you'll get more about it in the email, uh, and I'll sp uh, specify all the particulars about it. Um, today, I wanted to lecture about the Cold War period and uh, the period after the um, success of the Soviet Union in World War II against, uh, against the Nazis. And uh, I wanted to talk uh, about their legacy in general. Uh, next time, I'll talk about the Gorbachev period and uh, the Putin period, but uh, I won't be talking about the, the um, periods in general but talking about their um, uh, attitudes toward the Russian Revolution, how the uh, Russian Revolution has, uh, has changed, how the attitudes taken toward the Russian Revolution have changed um, as the regime is uh, uh, abandoned, as the revolution is abandoned in 1991, Soviet Union is partitioned, and then the Putin regime starts to make a comeback for successor Russia. They're all of their attitudes toward the Russian Revolution and how they think about it. and more or less how we face the whole question of the relation of the Russian Revolution to Putin's uh, to Putin's Russia. So we'll talk about that um, next time. And I guess that will be the finish to all of that. And, um, and then I'll talk um, next time as well. Or at any rate, I'll talk in my communication to you, my email to you. I'll talk about the, uh, the final. All right, so let's uh, talk about, um, let's start about Russia as it, uh, as it emerged in 1945 at the end of World War II after the successful struggle against fascism. Um, uh, um, I want to step back a little bit and try to make some generalizations about what this regime has meant in world history. What the world historian will have to confront when um, he or she takes a look at this period and uh, tries to assess what the revolution did to the, uh, what the Russian Revolution did to the world. And I think we can make some general general statements about it. First big general statement I guess I would make is that the Russian Revolution was a revolt against World War I, a revolt against imperialism, the imperialism of World War I, you'd have to say. Um, and then later on in the 20s, it uh, continued this revolt against the imperialism, pretty much imperialism, that is to say the world European colonialism, is what I'm talking about when I say imperialism, um, pretty much led by the British and the French to a lesser degree, but mostly by the British, still the enemy of the Russian uh, Revolution, but, um, you know, willing to uh, uh, willing to have a period, a period of detente in the 20s. That ends very quickly in 1927, and you know the result of that, the collectivization of agriculture uh, in, uh, in Russia, the first five-year plan. And, um, and then after that, the Stalin purges, not to blame the British leaders for bringing on Stalin's purges. That, I think, is an internal matter, internal to the Russian Revolution and something about which we had quite a bit to say. I'll, I'll be asking you uh, for your opinions about that when we uh, get to talking about it on the final. I'll be, I'll be offering you some kind of a way of uh, writing an essay about that if you're, if you're interested in that, um, uh, that topic. That'll be among the choices that you'll, that you'll have. But what can we say in general? Well, um, uh, the Russian Revolution uh, pretty much ends World War I. World War I pretty much ends on the note of the Russian exit from the uh, war with the revolution, with the United States intervention. So those two things, it's the outlier powers, the powerful influence they have on world history that strikes us uh, at the end of World War I. The Europeans are fading from the scene. The European imperialism is fading from the scene. And the outlier powers, um, Russia and the United States, both of them connected to imperialism in a certain way, but not entirely breathing its air uh, um, uh, as, much as, they, as much as they might. And then in the, um, in the 20s, and then most strikingly in the 30s, uh, there develops a fascist alternative to the socialist idea in Europe first in Italy, then in Germany, and that makes itself unequivocally, articulately, uh, the enemy 
of um, socialism and communism. Now, I, most people say it's the enemy of the Soviet Union or it's the enemy of communism. Um, but I would say that fascism, first and foremost, the enemy of socialism in general. It emerged in Italy pretty much as an enemy of the socialists. It crushed the socialist power. The communists weren't very important in Italy. It didn't save Italy uh, from communism, as Churchill uh, frequently said. That, that's wrong. It did not save Italy uh, from communism. It saved it from socialism. It saved, it, it did indeed save it. Um, and then uh, similarly with um, Hitler, he's got the Communist Party to worry about, as, as Mussolini did not. Um, but it's mainly the socialists. I think they still get more votes. They still have more influence in the working class in Germany. And so fascism emerges as an anti-socialist uh, phenomenon, which is also an anti-communist uh, phenomenon. And Hitler advertises it precisely that's what, that way. What can we say about that? The world historian looking at this asks what the Russian Revolution, uh, 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 what impact it had on history. We say it. it started the movement against imperialism, and it oh, just about finished it in the Cold War, I'm going to be arguing. And then secondly, it, uh, it uh, pretty much does the same with fascism. I mean, I think you have to say that the Soviets had much more of an influence on crushing fascism uh, than any other power in the world, and by a big margin. We have to make this generalization by a, by a big margin. So, um, the revolution then, the Russian Revolution, looms in world history as a revolt against uh, imperialism, war, and fascism, and a successful conqueror of those things, of those ideas. So uh, not to say that they are swept from the Earth's surface, as you see in this uh, uh, popular Soviet cartoon, not, not to say that all those things are swept from the uh, from the Earth's surface, but um, they pretty much get a very decisive blow struck against them. The most decisive blow, we have to say, from standpoint of of the world of the world historian. And then, um, uh, when we consider this great battle against um, imperialism and fascism, uh, what did the Russian Revolution achieve? I would say it, it achieves pretty much the liberation, at any rate, from those phenomena. The, the uh, phenomena, the, um, the liberation uh, with, a, uh, with a considerable success in a number of big countries. Well, first Russia, of course, but then India. I think you have to say that uh, there really was um, no really powerful movement against imperialism and uh, no really um, a great uh, alternative uh, to imperialism that was offered to the Indian nationalists. Uh, before the Soviet Union emerged. So it has a great deal uh, to do with uh, the liberation of India, has a great deal to do with the liberation of China. I mean, the first uh, big opponents of imperialism in China, the Kuomintang of Chiang Kai-shek and the Chinese Communist Party eventually led by Mao Zedong, both of them get their inspiration uh, from the Russian Revolution and the, most of their equipment the um, Guomindang, the nationalists, uh, pretty much are armed by the Soviets in the 20s, as we were indicating before. And then, of course, I, I don't need to say that anything about Mao. He, of course, is organized by the, by the um, Soviet Union and uh, also equipped. And I'm going to argue decisively equipped after World War II so that the Chinese Revolution is very much a product of the Soviet victory over fascism, and certainly a product of the Soviet defeat of Japanese power in the uh, in 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 the far east so let's see russia india uh, I, I, china um, um, uh, with china we have to say korea as well and israel the soviet union big supporter of israel as we'll be indicating soviet union takes in the cold war the attitude that there are going to be big changes made vis-a-vis uh, -vis the british empire and um, and the uh, Soviet Union was only too glad to help the Zionists against uh, Britain in uh, Palestine. Um, and this is a, not spoken about very much these days, but the, um, uh, the leaders of Israel, uh, Netanyahu and company, they know it quite well, and they've made reference to it recently, all the help they got from the, uh, uh, from the Soviet Union in the early days. And that isn't always necessarily a thing about which one can boast, as a matter of fact, because it was uh, during that time that the... Um, uh, the Zionists in Israel carried out this enormous cleansing, ethnic cleansing of the country, 
um, uh, when they drove some 800,000 um, Palestinians out of the country. Um, and that was done at a time when they, they had a big arms deal with the SCOTUS arms works in Czechoslovakia, which is arranged through the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union bears some responsibility. I'm sorry, a Palestinian historian, um, if he or she were able to um, um, uh, make this case now instead of me, instead of me doing it, um, I'm sure a Palestinian historian would say the Soviets aided and abetted Israel in their um, um, assertion of the dominance over the, uh, over the Palestinians in 1948. This is before the Soviets turned against Israel and started to support the Arabs against Israel to a greater extent after that. But at any rate, um, uh, perhaps Israel could be added to the list of countries liberated, so to speak, from imperialism, in this case, British uh, imperialism. And then there's Indochina from the French, and then there's Algeria from the French. Um, and then a number of other countries that I'll make mention of as we proceed today. So a very powerful in influence in liberating the colonies of Britain, France, Italy, Japan, Belgium, Portugal, finally Portugal in the 1970s, the Portuguese colonies. Um, the Soviets represent a big force um, in um, a place that they play a big role. You might say the biggest role. In, um, in opposing imperialism in all those, in all those cases. Um, all right, so that's a generalization the world historian can make, but um, what would the world historian say about this? Uh, did this happen as a result of the proletariat rising, the success of the Russian Revolution in that sense? I think you have to say no, say no. Really haven't got a proper example of a proletarian rising according to the model that the Bolsheviks had in mind when they took power in 1917. Remember that they take power with the idea that theirs is only going to be the first step in a whole string of revolutions in the most important countries in the world. It's not a national movement, Bolshevism. It's an international uh, revolutionary movement. It wants to sweep the earth clean of its, of its unclean. Of this, that's what the, is indicated in this uh, in this cartoon. Uh, Lenin uh, Lenin sweeps the earth clean from of the unclean, um, um, and it did not do it through did not do it through proletarian revolution. So there it is. Uh, I know what this says about Marxism. It's an interesting question for the historian to take up. Perhaps I figure out a way to ask you that question. Uh, but those of you who have ideas about it, I'd like to hear them. Um, did I think it did not do it through proletarian revolution, it did not do it through the workers of the world, really, uh, but it did it through war communism. War communism. Oh. Now, what is this war communism we're talking about? Well, that's the slogan of the organization of the Soviet Union between 1918 and 1921 during the years of the Civil War and Allied intervention. They called it war communism. They said the regime was war communism. They were going to go to state capitalism, we remember, in 1918. That was Lenin's argument. But very soon they had to drop that and adopt a, a scheme of war communism, which means they organize a whole economy for war. That's what socialism is in uh, the Russian Revolution. It's war communism. War communism. Um, so it's war communism that won the civil war for them. And it's war communism, you could argue, they go back to after the war scare in 1927 with the collectivization of agriculture and the uh, beginnings of the five-year plan period. That's war communism. World War II, well, of course, that's war communism. War communism. But after World War II, they helped the Chinese communists in the Civil War, help that was crucial, in my opinion, uh, would not have been possible, it seems to me, for Mao Zedong to have got the upper hand over the Kuomintang between 1947 and 1949 without all the Soviet help. Tanks, artillery, small arms, mortars, all sorts of help uh, that they got uh, in the way of um, uh, military gear uh, from the Soviet Union. So it's war, war communism again. That is the way uh, that revolution has been spread in the 20th century if you want to say that the communist or socialist idea had enormous success in the 20th century, it certainly did, um, I think you have to say that that's the reason why, that it's war communism. 
that it just happens to be up against imperialists, fascists, and bad characters of various sorts. Um, that's what gave the revolution its, its possibilities. Um, so that's what we have to say about the Russian Revolution. It's kind of an ironic prospect, not the only ironic prospect, the most ironic, strikes me, prospect about the whole thing is that this liberation project of revolution and socialism and all the rest of that stuff um, is led by one of the worst tyrannies of which we have a record in the 20th century. I mean, I don't think you can find a regime um, that was a worse tyranny, more frightful, fearful uh, terror than was carried out between 1936 and 1938 in the Soviet Union, Stalin's purchase. What an irony. I mean, it's a towering irony, it strikes me. The whole 20th century in terms of world history has this enormous ironic quality to it that this tremendous project of liberation, strictly speaking, I think according to almost any measure, liberation is also led by such a tyranny, such a grinding tyranny as that. Well, historians, they have to grapple with this whole question. This concept of irony, absolutely essential to, in the historian's arsenal in dealing with this, this matter. But let's not take the idea, or get the idea that this is entirely lost on the Russians themselves. Um, Soviets are aware of this, this towering irony and their subsequent history throughout the Cold War, right up to the time when they undertook the measures uh, that destroyed the Soviet Union and that really wrecked Soviet communism. I, I don't know how permanent it's going to be, but it looks pretty permanent. These were done in, a, in, an effect, in, in an attempt to overcome this irony, to try to clean the re regime up, to cleanse and reshape, as Isaac Deutscher, the historian Isaac Deutscher put it, to cleanse and reshape the socialist idea in Russia, to de-Stalinize, to go back and account somehow for Stalin's hideous tyranny, not to deny him that he was the warlord, who led war communism in its great victories. Not to deny him that. Russian nationalists will never deny him that. But there's the other side of it, the colossal tyranny, which nobody can, nobody can tolerate. And not least, uh, the Soviets themselves. They can't tolerate it either. Uh, so they will be undergoing various projects. Gorbachev will not be the first in the 1980s to try to de-Stalinize, to try to make some kind of a union uh, between socialism and real democracy as it would be understood, at least in the West, better, hopefully, than the Western democracy. But they always have this aim. Uh, they never reconcile themselves to the idea that the Stalinist regime was the only kind of regime you could have. That that's good Marxism. It isn't good Marxism. It isn't good anything. Uh, so there we are. What a uh, difficult problem for them. Uh, good for us to appreciate it. And then looking back, let's ask ourselves a few questions about the regime. Um, who were its main enemies? Um, um, well, before, before we ask that, maybe I'll ask a different question. Who were its friends? Who, who were the supporters and haters and abettors, if you want to think of it that way, of the Russian Revolution all over the world? Well, uh, maybe you say the workers of the world. That's the way, certainly the way it was intended, that the workers of the world were the great supporters. Were they? Were they during this period? We had to generalize about it. Will we, will we say that? I don't think we could say that. The workers of the world have a kind of an odd sort of intermediate position on, um, on Soviet communism. Uh, George Kennan put it very, very well in uh, the book he wrote called Russia and the West under Lenin and Stalin. George Kennan, the architect of the Cold War, pretty much, containment of the Soviet Union, all the rest of that. So he's no friend of communism. But he does say, you know, as a historian, he does say in this book um, that uh, the workers have always had a certain kind of, what's the word, sympathy is, perhaps that's not a bad word, sympathy. Uh, you can certainly say this about the 
British workers, and certainly about most workers in, uh, on the left of European polities, uh, um, polities um, and even to a degree, or considerable degree, I would say, in the United States. Uh, there's always been this kind of feeling that, um, well, even if we're not communists, even if we're um, um, maybe critical, highly critical of the communist regime, uh, that um, there is something of the labor movement in communism. Uh, the, the communism is not like fascism. It's, it's uh, related somehow to the labor movement. And uh, perhaps putting it more sharply and more to the point, the enemies, the people it's been up against, they're pretty much the enemies of the human race. So that's something that, that's not my observation, that's Kennan's observation um, in this book, The Russian and West Over Lenin and Stalin. I think I would buy this idea. Uh, it makes a certain amount of sense. Probably less so for the United States than for European labor movements and all the rest of that, many of which were communists and the center of gravity of the, of the labor movement in, as you know, in uh, France and Italy is, is communism. So the laborers vote, uh, the workers vote communists more than they do anything else uh, up until fairly recently. Um, and so um, there's something to this idea of the workers of the world. Uh, not as much as you might think, but some, there's something to it. Um, who are the other friends? The United States in 1918, briefly. Woodrow Wilson, Wilsonianism, you could say. The sixth point in the 14 points. That's friendly to the Soviet Union. And it says, uh, come on, Russia, get back in the war against Germany and all is forgiven. <laughs> Practically says something like something like that. And the Russians disappointed them by making the Pact of Brest-Litovsk, as you know. And then again, the United States in 1941, um, um, along with uh, Britain. And um, um, they are very, very intimately tied to the Soviet Union and probably would have wanted it to continue that way um, had things not, uh, not gone in, down a different path. The social democrats, how about social democracy and socialism? You know that socialism is not communism and a lot of socialists are critical of communists. Not just critical, a lot of them are downright hostile uh, and, and often they're the most hostile uh, to the communists. Um, this has certainly been the case, you know, in various periods, certainly throughout Europe after World War I, socialists were the biggest enemies of the communists. So what's their attitude toward it? Kind of that's once again, it's kind of in between. You might make a generalization comparable to Kennan's generalization about the workers of the world. Social Democrats in the Popular Front era, for example, um, three great cases of the Popular Front in, um, uh, France and Spain and China. China is another case of the Popular Front, the most successful, you might argue, case of the Popular Front. Uh, they combined with communists, socialists and communists combined. So, um, and this is not for love of communism or anything like that. It's just the idea that, um, that what they're up against is worse and that they all ought to somehow find common cause uh, together. And by the way, that's the attitude that liberalism took in the United States. Find, you have to find common cause with communism and against these fascists. We cannot uh, allow the world uh, to be run by the fascists. The fascists may be the greatest anti-communists in the world, but we still can't, still can't have that. That's the attitude that's taken pretty much in the, uh, in the 30s. Uh, British labor, pretty friendly to the Soviet Union in the 20s. I think you have to say in the 30s as, as well, pretty confused because the Soviet Union goes from being a pacifist power to being anti-fascist, which means warlike power in the 30s, but they, they, they go along. Winston Churchill, between 1936 and 1946, he argues you have to be with the Soviet Union. Cannot oppose fascism, cannot oppose Germany uh, without the Soviet Union. So Churchill, and Churchill was a fascist. Churchill was a great admirer of Mussolini, nonstop admired Mussolini, even in his memoirs, uh, excuse me, even in the multi-volume history of World War II, uh, written after the war, 
he still goes back and says, gee, too bad we couldn't have won over these fascists, Italian fascists. So, so he never abandoned his admiration for the fascist defense of traditional oligarchic society. That would be a good generalization. I would argue that almost anywhere at a conference, all the rest of that. And almost anybody who knows anything about Churchill will probably not offer uh, uh, any opposition to that uh, to that argument. Um, FDR, of course, he's a friend between 1941, 1945, his death in 1945. And um, last person we didn't mention, De Gaulle, he's a pretty consistent ally of the Soviet Union. He does not breathe the air of the Russian Revolution, not in the slightest. But he's always seen that France cannot be France without Russia. That, is, that means without the Russian Revolution. It's got to. And moreover, de Gaulle cannot be de Gaulle <laughs> without the support of the Communist Party in France. So there it is. He has always made common cause and always tried to make his politics cohere, blend, meld, not meld, uh, blend with the uh, with the uh, politics of the Soviet Union. But it's an interesting story that does not get a lot of discussion among historians, political writers, and all the rest of it. There's a vast ignorance about France and de Gaulle in the United States. Uh, but that, I think, is a fact. Um, then uh, who were the enemies? Who were the enemies of the, uh, of the uh, Russian Revolution? A lot, a lot of bad people, we have to say. They're not, uh, not delightful people. I guess you have to say imperialists, colonialists. They're against colonialism is the Russian Revolution, and colonialists are against the Russian Revolution. Um, and then I guess you also have to say in the 20s, the British opponents of what might be called Kamalism. Remember Kamal in Turkey, the Soviets supported Kamal. Kamal's not a communist, but he's um, opposed to British imperialism. And then you get an, an echo of that in uh, Afghanistan. Um, and then you have that same attitude in India, uh, that the British have to leave and anti-imperialism. They get a lot of support from the Soviet Union. So you might say it's all Kamalism. That idea, I called it national Bolshevism, that idea that um, the Soviets will support anybody who rises up against imperialism, whether they're communist, socialist, or whatever. Even if they're not particularly left, and you might say about Kamal, they're not particularly left. And this extends over into China uh, Soviet support for the, the Guomindang and, and uh, for the Chinese Communist Party at the same time. And by the way, those two have exactly the same position on Chinese nationalism. And uh, for the, most of their history, they're pro-Soviet. Of course, the Guomindang turns against the Soviet Union, uh, but that's a diplomatic thing that has to do with the British in the 30s as to that. Um, so those are, the, those are the enemies. I guess we also have to say the appeasers who want to... Uh, somehow play ball with communists. There's always a temptation to think that the communists um, are the main enemy and that um, if, if we play ball with Hitler, Mussolini, and uh, Japanese fascism in the Far East, um, somehow they'll help us with this problem we have with communism. Um, there's always that kind of temptation among uh, the appeasers. You see it in all their writings. Um, and the U.S. isolationists in the uh, in the 30s who are kind of the analogy of it. A lot of them are just plain appeasers. They have that attitude. And some of them are just isolationists. Not, and bear in mind, some of these appeasers and isolationists are just pacifists. They don't want another war. That does not need interpreting. But I'm talking about the rest of it, the political side of it, in addition to that pacifist, uh, that pacifist perspective. Those are enemies. And lastly, what Churchill called and this is a kind of interesting phrase that Churchill used uh, when he started to realize that uh, Soviet Union had to be on board or we're never going to defeat fascism. Um, 
he started to talk about a class political reaction. That's the term. That's the phrase he used. He used this to to uh, Roosevelt. He said, um, "I can do a lot of things in Britain, but often there's a class political reaction." That's what he's talking about um, when I say I'm, I'm referring to that when I uh, speak about the um, how to put it the um, pro-fascist attitude that a lot of the appeasers and the people on the right had in um, in Britain. Uh, Churchill, that, Churchill, I think, gives us a good phrase for that, the class political reaction. Well, um, after the war, the, um, the Soviet Union wanted to integrate with the West. Um, but it thought that this integration would be made on the basis of the, a West that was highly left. Soviets thought it couldn't be anything lefter than Roosevelt. I think they're right. That American liberalism was about as, as progressive as anything progressive ever gets. I think it was more progressive than social democracy um, of the European type, as a matter of fact. So Stalin wanted to make wanted to be part of that and thought the Soviet Union could profit being part of that. Thought that might be the main trend and thought the main trend would be to continue with anti-imperialism and that the British and the French imperial powers, they'd have to be given up. And the smaller powers, you know, the uh, Belgians couldn't hang on to the Congo. No. The <laughs> Portuguese couldn't hang on to all those countries in Africa. No, 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 no. It'd be this huge anti-imperialist thing. Roosevelt was against imperialism. Uh, Stalin, Stalin was right, I think, about that. Um, so after the war, there and then especially this is underlined when Churchill lost the election in 1945, and labor took over. So Soviet policy at that time was to integrate itself, uh, go to the right, soften up all of its revolutionary language, be, be a good liberal, be a good social democrat, a good British laborite, a good New Dealer, support of the left and liberals, blah, 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 that sort of thing. It's wrong, the way historians argue, that the Soviets are carrying out this aggression against the world. Communist aggression is phrased as absolutely nonsense. It does not make sense to the historian. Uh, communist aggression, meaning military threat, you know, marching on other countries with armed forces. No, that's not what it was. What they are talking about there is the threat of communist encouragement to the left in the West. Uh, that's what they mean. And uh, usually when anti-communists uh, write their propaganda, do their movies in the 50s and 60s, uh, that's what they're talking about, the insidious actions of the Communist Party trying to take advantage of some such trade union dispute or blah, 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 that sort of thing. Uh, that's what they're worried about. Um, but not aggression with armed forces. That's um, although, although I just got through saying a few minutes ago that they gave a lot of weapons to Mao Zedong in China. Okay, so that's a point on their side. If you want to say, if you want to call it communist aggression, that's certainly with weapons and all the rest of it, communist aggression. But I guess they would come back, the Russians would come back and say, how about the aggression of the imperialists to defend imperialism? And how about the aggression of the United States to give them military support? I guess they'd have a point there about anti, anti imperialism. Well, after the war, though, I uh, would make the point that um, Stalin wanted to advance communism. The liberals, my friends, people most close to my milieu and all the rest of that, I think the liberals are wrong about this. They say the Soviets are just trying to defend themselves at the end of the war. Um, they've stopped being communist a long time ago. They're not Trotskyists. They're communist. They're Stalinists. Stalinists are national communists. That's the argument. I think that's wrong. I don't think that argument holds up. Uh, it does not account for the events um, in the period. I think that Stalin remains a revolutionary. He wants to overthrow all the existing relations world, but the, but the way he wants to do it is by helping Roosevelt to undo the European empires. That's the whole conception 
and it gets a very precise statement by a man named Varga. But before we go to showing a picture of Varga, not a particularly flattering one, but a picture nonetheless, there's an indication of the war deaths. Here's a pie of the deaths. Pie diagram. See that uh, they've got 25 million for the Soviets, deaths in World War II, and almost 20 million for the Chinese. So a very considerable toll they paid. We look at, uh, it's almost impossible to find the American one in there, but the American one's around 300,000 deaths. 300,000, it's less than died in traffic accidents during the period. So Soviet contribution to World War II, very considerable, very considerable. Um, and after the war, the Soviets take over a block in Eastern Europe. So most of the arguments about uh, communist aggression come from Euro the European um, context and the Soviets uh, in Europe, the way they see it is uh, strategically, they've defeated Germany, they wanna keep Germany disunited if possible, or I mean, it would be optimal if they could unite Germany altogether, uh, that, would be, that would be the best. See if I can get my pointer happening here. Yes, maybe so. So the uh, Soviets would have loved to have some kind of unity of the Germanies on their terms, of course, or on terms that were intermediate, terms they could agree with the West, but not in terms of um, a German state being hostile to the Soviet Union. That, they couldn't do that. Um, and then once you say that this German state has to somehow be unthreatening to the Soviet Union, um, which I think we can understand when we consider World War II, why the Soviets would feel this way about the German threat. Um, when Germany has to be, how to put it, denationalized to some degree, um, if that's the case, Poland can't be hostile to the Soviet Union. Does this make sense? Would a Russian statesman of any sort want to set up a Poland that's hostile to the Soviet Union? No. If he had any influence over it, wouldn't he try to influence politicians and impose upon them some kind of system? And that's certainly the case. So the arguments then about uh, the oppression of Poland on the part of the Soviet Union, they have an answer the Soviets would give from the standpoint of their national security. And what good would it do to neutralize Germany and against a possible rebirth of the German threat? Remember, this Russia had been invaded twice already, um, uh, what good would it do to, uh, to neutralize Germany if Poland was hostile? So that implies Poland and all the rest of it. Now, I have not made much of an argument for the communist regime in Czechoslovakia and Hungary and Romania and Bulgaria from the standpoint of security, eh, but you know, once you have got, st got started like this, it sort of fits into the same pattern. One can argue that all of this has a national security aspect for the Soviets. That's very important. Now, am I arguing they're not trying to spread the revolution? No, of course they are. Try to spread the revolution as much as they can. Uh, but the early regime they had in East Central Europe was not at all communist. They tried to revive all the peasant parties. They had communist parties participating in the governments of France and Italy communist government. So they figured as long as the communist governments are permitted in France and Italy, we'll permit peasant parties or non-communist, anti-communist often, um, to run the governments in East Central Europe. And that's what they did before 1948. So um, that was the initial plan. Uh, we're not going to have this big division between East and West. A country like Czechoslovakia, a communist country, uh, they got popularly elected, communists got popularly elected there. That was their whole scheme too. We don't want a big division between East and West, such as you see on this map. We want kind of a general unity uh, among all of the Europeans. You'll put up with communists in the, in the West and we'll put up with non-communists in a place where we, communists could easily chase them out in uh, 
in Eastern Europe. Um, that's the scheme of, um, of a number of people. Uh, we want, and the, the argument is usually made by many of my colleagues that it's all the Soviets wanted was friendly states and all the rest of that. They're not communists. And that's certainly part of the thing, but that does not exhaust, exhaust the whole topic because uh, the, the Soviets wanted to make political gains, but they wanted a very liberal and evolutionary gains in order to keep the United States happy, in order to keep social Democrats and other people of the left who might be friendly, keep them happy. In other words, really to uh, use their soft power, we would call it now, uh, to the maximum. This is the Soviet threat, the real Soviet threat. Those who hate the Soviet Union hate this soft power worse than they hate Soviet weapons, if it's more, more effective. So I think that has to be borne in mind. Soviet imagery is that there are four policemen uh, marching through the world. It's the imagery of Roosevelt as well, four great states. We've got the Soviet Union marching here. The, it's the last boot, a little out of your picture. Soviet Union marching together with the United States, together with Britain. And then the fourth power is China. It's Roosevelt's idea. China's going to be a great power under the Kuomintang. China's going to be a great power. Soviet Union would have put up with that and would have done its best to make the Chinese communists put up with it. Uh, but it proved to be impossible under the circumstances. These were created by the Chinese communists, but also created in the West. Um, and the whole question of what's going to go on in the rest of the world also emerged at that time. Um, how, how is the world going to be decolonized? What's going to happen to India? British are still thinking when the Cold War breaks out uh, that somehow they're going to hang on in India. Um, and somehow they're going to hang on pretty much everywhere they have hung on. Um, they're going to use one device or another, the Commonwealth or whatever, uh, and not going to uh, um, lose these countries to independent politics and especially politics which might be hostile to them. You could say that this is. Um, analogous to the attitude of the Soviets about, to, to their surrounding states. The British had this attitude toward their colonies. The French pretty much echo them. And this map gives an indication of the very considerable French interest in Africa, many countries in Africa, um, 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 are colonies of the French. You know, hang on to those if at all possible. And then there, of course, are the Belgians have the Congo, the Portuguese have Angola, Mozambique, Guinea Bissau. Sao Tome, all the rest of that. I have some territories in the Pacific as well. French also have Indochina, a very considerable colonial world at the end of World War II. Soviets would like to work with the United States and other progressive people to decolonize, not necessarily with force, but to decolonize if possible. And uh, this whole scheme is the attitude, or I should say is the project of um, uh, Eugen Varga, who is a Soviet economist and the one who's best uh, associated with this notion, the idea of a people's democracy in East Central Europe and all the rest of that. So Varga preaches the line that Roosevelt is siding with uh, Stalin against Churchill. The United States liberalism is siding with communism against British imperialism, the way he thinks of it. Um, that's the main tendency. Varga is the real architect of Stalin's foreign policy before the Cold War set in. Varga. Um, but the Cold War did set in. Um, the British conservatives who've been isolationists prior to the war, they got to Churchill. Churchill tells about it. Um, they had been isolationists, these uh, diehards, these right-wingers in the uh, Tory party, they had been isolationists and they'd been kind of pro-Hitler to some degree. And uh, when Churchill started to go towards the Soviet Union after 1936, they were very hostile to him. And uh, during the war, they played ball, but at the end of the war, Churchill tells us, uh, they started to get very keen about the Soviet Union, want to get after the Soviet Union. So Churchill pretty much 
arguing their points. He's out of office at this point, 1946, when he gives his speech against the Soviet Union, 1946. That's Truman uh, in his regalia um, on the left there, sitting on the dais. Um, so Churchill became an enemy and defender of the British Empire, uh, which means that, therefore that uh, you have to try to influence the United States to be more hostile to communism. Um, and you can see the British motives to this. They're pretty straightforward, in my opinion. The British imperialist pretty much, if he wants, thinking about defending the empire, has to think in these terms. With regard to Poland, um, uh, they really say it all centers on Poland. I don't, I don't think it centers on Poland, uh, but here's a map of Poland that helps us to understand it a little bit better from the standpoint of territory and uh, what the Poles are claiming about the, the, uh, the territory. So here, here you have, uh, so here you have um, the lands east of the oder nysa line. These are German territories with probably nine million or so Germans. The Poles completely expel them. You never hear anybody say anything on their behalf, these poor people. But they're the Germans. These are traditionally German lands. They're all driven right out. All these German towns renamed. Breslau becomes Wrocław. Stettin becomes Szczecin. Indicate all Polish names for these German German towns, drive them right out, uh, and they all go back into the German, um, uh, West German regime, and they become very hostile to communism, of course, it goes without saying. Um, and the Poles are not, not given this territory up. They're gonna hang on to this territory. They hold on to it today. It's Polish, according to them, but it really is German, strictly speaking. And then what they gave up to the Soviet Union is all the territory in the East, non-Polish, as a matter of fact, non-Polish, so you might say that this is probably the best looking, most, um, what do you call it? The best looking and most um, territorially and ethnically integrated Poland that has ever existed, uh, today's Poland. So that's Stalin's Poland. Stalin was the one who gave that to them. How ironic, huh? Stalin was the one who gave that to them. The Poles today are very, very hostile to Russia. It's no longer hostile to Stalin or communism or anything like that. It's just hostile to Russia. Um, so the Poles are, uh, this is the position that the Poles have. Well, what's the attitude of the United States and Britain toward that after the, in the Cold War? Um, um, Churchill said that the demand of the Poles to get back these territories in the East, um, these non-Polish lands, and they have about 9 million or so in, the, in those territories as well, the ones in the Soviet Union, so, the Poles, he, Churchill thought the Poles were crazy to make this argument. He never supported it. So he was not going to buck the Soviet Union, argue with the Soviet Union over this Polish imperialism, you could even call it. Um, not going to support them. And that more or less is the position that Churchill and Roosevelt felt they had to take. Now, you could say, defenders of Roosevelt always say, well, Roosevelt couldn't, couldn't do any better for the Poles. What would he have done if he could do better? It's not exactly an easy thing to sort out ethnically. <laughs> um, strictly speaking, maybe you could have elections and let them all be independent or something like that. Um, but it's not an easy problem for a diplomat uh, to figure out. I don't think if, it, what a, no matter what the attitude of the United States was, even if it was ready to have a war with the Soviet Union over this, um, whether it could have figured out exactly what to do with Poland here. Not an easy, not an easy thing. And the hostility of the Poles toward the Russians, that has to be taken into consideration when you are analyzing the attitude the Russians have to take to the, about this from standpoint of national security. Well, at any rate, um, the Cold War develops uh, and a part of it is in the United States because there's a, um, um, a very considerable uh, body of opinion in the United States that went along with Roosevelt's New Deal in the solid South, so to speak. So you, there you see the states involved. They're all democratic in the days of the New Deal. And um, Roosevelt couldn't do anything about Jim Crow in the South, could not stick up for the oppressed black people of the South under these awful Jim Crow regimes. 
uh, but simply had to help them as much as he could with economic development and hope somehow something would come of that. And what was coming of it was trade, the trade unionization of the South, uh, which uh, all these Southern states were worried about because they had a lot of, had a lot of industrial workers. Um, and um, it, it's increased by the New Deal programs. So they were really worried that the New Deal was going to try and liberate the black people in the South from Jim, from Jim Crow. And uh, they fought this off by calling it communism. It's a big thing in the United States. If you really want to understand American anti-communism, you cannot understand it properly without taking this into consideration. I think that really this is the heart and soul of American anti-communism is this Jim Crow attitude in the, in the South, this uh, feeling that the New Deal has to be curbed, has to be stopped at the end of the war, and that the communists have to be fought. Race mixing is communists, say these demonstrators. Well, well that's quite a leap there, and, and maybe it is, maybe it is. Um, at least as far as they're, I mean, when they say communist, they mean, I mean it's bad, I mean it's bad. Is this fascist sentiment? I don't know. The fascists would have understood and recognized and sympathized with this. And maybe even today, this sort of sentiment, such as it exists in the United States, is sympathized with by people who would probably call themselves fascists. Um, but anyhow, this is a big factor. And a huge link might be made between the thinking of this sort of element in the United States and the older attitude of anti-communism, you know, it's Jewish Bolshevism. I don't know if it can really be properly linked to anti-Semitism. There are a lot of people who are experts on this topic and probably have more about to say than I do. Um, but the fascist propaganda um, pretty much argued that uh, Jewish Bolshevism was the main thing um, that they were up against and, um, and um, and the Jews, of course, are behind behind communism in general, and in America under a lot of lurid stuff and American propaganda. Perhaps you know about this or have been reading this stuff and or seeing this stuff in movies. You know, reading it in comic books, the commie plot, and all the rest of that. Um, maybe some of the bad things they say about communism are true. I'm sure there's some element of truth in this stuff, but. Um, is it a historical point of view, such as we're, we're taking up in this course or any other course that deals with, uh, with this historical period? Not, not very much. And so there isn't, there isn't much, that's the word, not much science, not much knowledge, not much history in this uh, kind of anti-communism, such as developed in the United States. And McCarthyism is sometimes argued has this filiation, affinity, this con continuity, be another way of saying it, with the anti-communism of the fascists in the 30s. So all of these represented real forces at the end of World War II. Um, this cartoon shows uh, the American nu nuclear monopoly in 1945. Here's Lowe. We've been following Lowe's cartoons on all this. Uh, we found them very interesting. I'm, I'm fascinated with them. They represent a real center of gravity in British opinion and very, in my opinion, kind of a wholesome center of gravity. Well, anyhow, here he's complaining about the nuclear monopoly that Truman is presenting to the world. But it's a, a complaint that the British under Attlee and the Soviets under Stalin, um, they both find it to be an ultimatum against that. The 12 points is a, um, a line of American policy that uh, Truman laid out in 1945, and it includes um, the, the assumption that uh, that the uh, Americans are going to keep uh, nuclear weapons, and they're not going to not going to help Stalin, and they're not going to help the British either. The British are going to have to develop both these people, um, Stalin and Attlee, are going to have to develop their own nuclear programs in order to have nuclear weapons. The United States is not going to help them uh, with that. Um, well, there's kind of a feeling that maybe that uh, the United States is making a turn and getting to be um, a load as far as the British are concerned. But the British will fix that because they will do their best to create an atmosphere where the United States dislikes Soviet Union more, more than them and, fa and favors them. 
And one other aspect of this is that Varga's line about how the Soviets ought to um, stress their soft power with the left, which I think is the Soviet line, it has this little problem with it that Tito in Yugoslavia represented a genuinely revolutionary regime. He was going to continue to make revolution in Greece, war communism again. The, uh, the rebels against the Nazis, they'd beaten the Nazis, and so well, they were going to carry on and help the Greek communists. They probably could have taken uh, Greece without much difficulty had there not been an intervention against them. Um, uh, but Stalin promised that the British could have Greece, and uh, he kicked, kicked Tito out of the common forum in 1948 because he was afraid of bucking the United States and Britain over Greece. So that's an act of, of how shall we put it, some kind of communists could accuse Stalin of cowardice there. But anyhow, he's afraid of taking on the British and the Americans, and he expels Tito. It's a really genuinely revolutionary fighter with a revolutionary regime in um, Yugoslavia. He expels him. So the idea that the Soviets are just hell-bent on revolution and communist aggression, blah, 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 where does it go? They're so afraid that they're, they get rid of Tito. Tito was probably more of a revolutionary here than Stalin. I shouldn't say probably. He was more of a revolutionary than Stalin. Uh, and uh, Stalin wants to back off, wants to back off from this. But where he backed off in Europe, he came on strong in the Far East. He started to give weapons to the Chinese in 1947, realizing that he's not going to get his way, that there's going to be a Cold War, and that the United States won't put up with any kind of um, general unity. Roosevelt's gone now. Truman is under the sway of Churchill. The Soviets are not going to have any unity with the West, not with the West, with the United States at this point anymore. Uh, so to hell with them. And uh, so he start giving weapons. And uh, this is the first influx of lots of weapons into the Chinese uh, situation. The communists never had much beyond small arms, mortars, and things of that sort. Now they get a lot of tanks, artillery, rocketry, all sorts of implements of war, and they start to win big set-piece battles. The United States, too, throws out everything it can uh, in, into the fight, um, supporting the Guomindang in these big set-piece battles, which it loses. Course of the civil war, and those little uh, crossed rifles there that indicate all the battles. The little red arrows indicate the battles. And you see the main strength of the communists in the north, where the, they can be supplied by the Soviets, and where the Soviets have pretty much won over. Pretty much won over this area, of Manchuria here. Pretty much won that by defeating the Japanese at the end of '45. So they stay there. And uh, at first they give weapons to the Guomindang because they want to restrain the Chinese. But then when that doesn't work and the West becomes um, um, more interested in Cold War in Europe, they turn to the Soviets to the East and start supporting China. Could make the argument, which I've made, that if um, the West had gone easy, or I should, if the United States had gone easy with the Soviets in Europe, that maybe the Soviets would not have helped the Chinese communists so much. And maybe they could have staved off the Chinese Revolution. That's not a right-wing thought or a left. It might be a right-wing thought, as a matter of fact. It could be a left-wing thought or right-wing thought, but it's a thought. It's a, it's a historical thought uh, that the Chinese Revolution has something to do with the Cold War in the West. Anyhow, this is the area of strength. And the Chinese communists, so they're going to pour out of the North, and eventually they're going to... Stalin tried to stop them and try to partition, in fact, but Mao didn't want to do that. There's only so much Stalin could dictate to Mao with all these armies on the march. Um, and eventually, they end up uniting all of China. Oh, goodness. So these two fellows, oh, Mao Zedong, not quite in your picture there. I wish I had done a better job of that. He's right at the edge here. Um, and uh, Chiang Kai-shek right in the middle. And on the left, Patrick Hurley for the Americans trying to broker a unity between the Guomindang and China. No soap. 
never going to work out that way. It's going to be Mao's victory completely in China. Um, Mao and Stalin winning in China and then speaking to the world about um, uh, the world historic importance of the expansion of the Russian Revolution into China, the Chinese Revolution, and the decline of the imperial powers that was set in motion by this. And I don't think you can say it's set in motion by, by that, but it's given a very, very powerful follow up um, this uh, unity of the communists in Russia and China and their message unto the third world. A message unto the West is, is not that powerful. And if, as a matter of fact, the West was absolutely fear, fearful about this whole thing and very hostile to the Sino-Soviet bloc, opposed it with nuclear weapons, had to face nuclear parity with it eventually, etc. Uh, but to the third world, uh, the Chinese revolution, I think, was magic uh, and represents a, the considerable force at the end of the 50s and the 60s. This is the Bandung Conference in 1955. Here are all the peoples of the world are saying, oh, we are the non-white peoples of the world. And they have the Chinese participating in this thing. Mao Zedong is going to be very friendly with a lot of these third world leaders, all the most famous ones, Nehru of India, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, all the rest of that. They will be the big forces in the 50s and in the, uh, and in the 60s. There's Mao shaking hands with Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana. So uh, very intimate. There's uh, uh, Nkrumah of Ghana uh, with Che Guevara, uh, Cuba. So, you know, it's, it's a tricontinental uh, perspective of revolution throughout the world, connected somehow to the Soviet bloc, China and Russia, all the rest of that. There's Muhammad Ali, the great American heavyweight fighter. With, he's with Nkrumah. Um, um, expressing his cultural nationalism there with the dashiki, uh, etc. Um, Martin Luther King was very friendly with uh, with uh, Kwame Nkrumah. So Martin Luther King breathed the air of this third world revolt against European imperialism, which he thought the United States ought to be part of, might have been part of, perhaps at one point uh, under Roosevelt, but not since not since then. Uh, and um, this is sort of the opposite number of what we're arguing before about the solid South, about anti-communism, about, um, um, about the, Bourbon, the Bourbon South and, um, and its uh, reaction in the United States and its uh, driving force, uh, anti-revolution, genuinely, how to put it, counter-revolutionary uh, point of view, uh, comparable to what you might have seen in Europe in the 1920s uh, among, the, among the fascists at least from the standpoint of anti-communism. Um, now, under these circumstances, Khrushchev decided that uh, Stalin kicking Tito out of the, uh, out of the, um, uh, the communist movement uh, back in 1948, uh, maybe this ought to be rethought and that maybe, um, maybe Tito ought to be reconciled. And the reason Khrushchev um, uh, thought this way was that Tito was in with all of these third world revolutionaries. He's a communist. He's kicked out of the bloc, uh, but he was very friendly with them. And so Khrushchev wanted to reconcile with Tito and he had a discussion with Tito and Tito said, it's on account of Stalin. Uh, Khrushchev said, okay, we'll criticize Stalin. That's the background to de-Stalinization. It's Khrushchev's attempt to hook up with the third world revolutionary movement against Western imperialism uh, is more bold than that um, view than Stalin. The Soviet Union is stronger under Khrushchev in the late 50s than it, is, than it was under Stalin in the late 40s. He starts criticizing Stalin, cult of the personality, they call it. And that brings up all sorts of things. The Chinese start to break with Stalinism, um, or I should start to break with Khrushchev the main thing there is nuclear weapons. Khrushchev refused to give nuclear weapons to the Chinese. That's really the main reason of the Sino-Soviet split, but it starts to get more serious through the 60s. Then the United, then a new generation comes in, it's my generation, comes into this thing. Um, they're gonna be sent to Vietnam to fight arms in hand against communism. They're gonna die, as many of them are gonna die as I've died in this corona 
epidemic we're facing right now, 60,000. Fighting arms in hand against communism, just the same way you fought against fascism. Same thing. Vietnamese fighting for independence with the communists as their leaders. That's the same thing as Adolf Hitler. Very tough thing to sell to the American youth, to the youth of my generation. Now they bought it at first, but then when they started getting killed in large numbers, they started losing the war in Vietnam, and they turned against it powerfully, turned against anti-communism. Anti-communism, they decided, was poison. That attitude developed powerfully in the, in the 60s. Uh, and sympathy for the Cuban Revolution goes along with it. And by the end of the 60s, in communism, I think what you really are getting is a whole series of ideas, especially with regard to this generation, uh, the generation of the people of the 60s, a whole series of ideas, no one idea encompasses the whole thing. You could be a Stalinist or a Trotskyist, a lot of Trotskyism, people who felt Trotsky had been right all along, or proponents of one or another kind of, God knows what, anarchism too. Um, but um, in communism, there's no one real center of gravity ideologically in communism in the 1960s. And from that point on, I think you have to say, uh, polycentrism was the word they used. And I think it's a, a pretty good description. Polycentrism in world communism, abetted after 1975 by Euro communism, the idea that if communism spreads in Europe, uh, the European communists are not going to go the way, not going to follow the line of the Soviet Union. That's a break with the Soviet Union on the part of the West European communists. They say all this disunity shows they're falling apart. Okay, maybe, but it might indicate the reverse. All this disunity might indicate that their movement's becoming more and more successful. More and more people are getting into the definition of the concept and it's starting to, starting to be transformed. I think that needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, at any rate, it's a movement that's having huge influence in the world. I have actually looked on the internet like a demon for a decent map. I haven't found one of these in years to draw one up for myself. Uh, a decent map to show all the different communist countries there were in the world. I found a number of screwy maps, um, some of them worse than others, all of them pretty bad. The internet's not great for maps always. In fact, usually not great. Um, but this, I think, gives an idea of the main points. There's the Soviet Union. Communism in China, we know. Vietnam, that was a communist country after the victory in 1975. Other communist countries, Laos became communist. No, they don't have Laos here. They have Cambodia as a communist. Okay, that was for a while too. Uh, Laos becomes communist. India is not communist, but always oh, very pro Russian. Very pro Russian. Um, um, what other communist regimes? Well, you know, the 1970s, you have a communist regime in Mozambique, Ang excuse me, Angola, Mozambique, uh, Ethiopia, uh, Guinea-Bissau. Uh, they have Ghana here as a communist regime. I just, maybe they were left-wingers. Um, they also have Peru as a communist regime. Uh-uh. Chile. What under Ind? Uh, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but anyhow, considerable influence. And then of course we had a really decent map that showed all the socialist influence in the world, all the different kinds of socialisms during the era of polycentrism, of Arab socialism and and African socialism, other sorts of notions. There's a very considerable influence, intellectual influence, Cuban communism, you know, all the rest of that a very considerable influence throughout the third world, not in the first world, not much in Europe, and um, not uh, much in the far, in the Middle East, I think we have to say. 
uh, but everywhere else, a considerable influence, enough to scare um, scare Americans uh, who are anti, scare anti-communists in, in, in general. Um, but that's not going to last. Russia is going to be partitioned, as going to happen because of a review of communism, uh, because of a review of the things that happened in this course. So uh, we want to look at that uh, very carefully. And that'll be the last thing we'll talk about. Next time, I want to talk about the review of the communist idea that was taken up, which is a review of its history, stuff we've been studying, that was taken up by Gorbachev. And I want to argue that that's the main thing, that retooling of the ideology of communism is the main thing that caused the Soviet Union to fall. Uh, that is, say, their, it was their, their, their history, the study of their history that caused them to fall. Um, so um, I want to take that up next time. And, and also, I want to take up the idea um, of Putin as a successor to the great power the Soviet Union and Russia had in the 20th century, the revival of Russia. Uh, that uh, took place under Putin after the 21st century uh, um, turned. Um, so those are the things I want to take up next next time. Um, and I will have your final thing at that time as well. So thanks for your attention to this thing.